Bonjour à tous. Euh, je n'avais pas prévu de parler en anglais, donc je vais préparer quelques mots en français. Ce sera très, très, très court. Euh, je voulais d'abord vous remercier de me donner l'opportunité de dire un mot là, au, au, au nom de l'INDP3, euh, en occasion de ces journées en hommage à, à, à Pierre Vignetri. Euh, tout d'abord, je vais m'excuser de ne pas avoir être, été avec vous euh, hier. Euh, et aussi, euh, je vais devoir euh, m'en aller assez rapidement, donc euh, excusez-moi pour ça. Euh, J'ai quand même tenu à, à venir dire quelques mots. Euh, parce que je pense, euh, et je peux le dire sans hésiter, que Pierre Minetri, c'était vraiment, euh, disons, dans les, dans les 30 dernières années, a été une personne clé à l'IN de P3. Euh, et, euh, et donc, euh, il restera dans, les, dans, les mémoires de, dans la mémoire des, des chercheurs de l'IN de P3, euh, disons, de manière très présente, euh, non seulement comme le, le directeur de, de l'APC, donc il a été pendant une douzaine d'années, je pense que vous avez abondamment parlé, mais aussi comme, disons, l'inspirateur et le porteur d'une politique scientifique ambitieuse d'ouverture de l'Institut. En fait, sous son, disons, impulsion, l'Institut a ouvert, disons, son champ de recherche, je dirais, dans, dans deux directions nouvelles et essentielles, finalement, pour le futur de l'Institut. Euh, donc d'une part, euh, j'imagine que vous en avez parlé euh, vers euh, euh, l'astrophysique et les astroparticules. Et donc ce laboratoire, la PC, évidemment, on est, on est un exemple, euh, l'exemple euh, emblématique. Mais aussi, et vous en avez parlé, j'en suis sûr, euh, vers, vers la théorie. Euh, et ce laboratoire est aussi un exemple de cette ouverture. Euh, je, je, je veux le mentionner parce que ce n'est pas une évidence. Euh, euh, L'IN2P3 est associé de particuliers. Euh, que la théorie euh, disons, concernant la recherche qui est faite dans cet institut est en fait euh, pilotée par un autre institut du CNRS. Euh, et donc euh, cette anomalie, si j'ose dire, euh, avait bien sûr été identifiée par Pierre euh, qui euh, très rapidement a essayé de, 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 disons de, euh, de faire ce pont entre la théorie euh, donc un peu piloté, un peu séparé de ce qui se passait dans, dans les N2P3 et ce qui se passait dans les N2P3. Euh, et dès le début de sa carrière, il a, euh, disons, agi et milité pour euh, euh, réduire ce, ce gap, si j'ose dire, en organisant des rencontres entre théoriciens et expérimentateurs, bien sûr, et, euh, et en créant et animant, et ça, et ça, je suis sûr que vous en avez déjà parlé, euh, pendant des années, le, le GDR Supersymétrie, euh, qui, euh, que, que beaucoup d'entre vous, et j'en étais, euh, auquel beaucoup d'entre vous ont assisté et ont, ont participé. Il a aussi, euh, Pierre a aussi su voir les liens grandissants entre la physique de l'infiniment petit et celle de l'infiniment grand. Donc maintenant, on dit que l'IN de P3, c'est l'institut des deux infinis. Euh, et donc, étendre ici encore le domaine scientifique et technique de recherche des chercheurs de l'Institut. Euh, en, euh, par exemple, les encourageant à utiliser des télescopes, hein, ce qui n'était pas une évidence euh, dans cet institut, évidemment, ou, et même euh, des satellites. Euh, donc, euh, je pense que ça, c'est vraiment une chose importante à noter. Euh, certes, utilisant des télescopes et des satellites, mais toujours sans perdre de vue euh, l'aspect physique fondamental et l'aspect expérience de recherche, et pas, euh, disons, euh, de manière plus générale, observatoire, ou, ou, euh, euh, qui sont traditionnellement la manière d'utiliser ces instruments. Alors moi, je n'ai personnellement pas travaillé directement avec Pierre euh, Binetrui. Euh, évidemment, je l'ai beaucoup côtoyé comme euh, collègue directeur, euh, puisque j'étais directeur d'un laboratoire voisin. Euh, si voisin, en fait, qu'il était euh, presque euh, ennemi ou en tout cas parfois concurrent. Mais ça, c'est une autre histoire. Je ne vais pas euh, en parler aujourd'hui. Euh, J'aimerais quand même mentionner une, une, une petite euh, disons, anecdote, si j'ose dire, qui, euh, qui met en évidence... Je pense euh, assez bien le, la perspicacité et le flair scientifique de, de Pierre. Donc un peu après mon retour des États-Unis, et donc à la fin des années 90 ou au milieu des années 90, un peu, plus, un peu, un peu après, où j'avais travaillé donc sur la mesure de l'expansion de l'univers, Pierre est venu me voir pour euh, euh, proposer une collaboration sur l'interprétation euh, des mesures que nous venions de faire. Alors, je me souviens qu'à l'époque, je n'ai pas bien compris euh, ce qu'il voulait faire. Euh, en fait, en tant qu'expérimentateur, qu euh, pour nous, la mesure de l'accélération de l'expansion occupait toute notre énergie. Et, et en fait, on n'imaginait pas ou je n'imaginais pas, euh, comme beaucoup de mes collègues, une alternative à euh, la constante cosmologique, par exemple. 
Et lui, au contraire, avait rapidement vu que cette mesure, euh, cette mesure donc, comme un moyen de tester des nouvelles théories en lien avec la physique des particules, euh, comme par exemple la présence d'un nouveau champ scalaire ou de nouvelles physiques qui sont responsables de cette accélération. Et ça, je crois que euh, c'est vraiment quelque chose qui le, qui le caractérisait, c'est-à-dire euh, d'essayer de, de voir euh, si euh, on peut d'une certaine manière, euh, euh, interpréter les, les résultats d'une manière euh, euh, liée fortement à la physique fondamentale. Voilà, donc j'ai un peu parlé du passé. Euh, je voudrais terminer en disant un mot sur le futur. Euh, donc euh, peut-être en avez-vous parlé, mais donc Pierre a passé quelques temps aux États-Unis, à Berkeley, au Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Je vois Georges dans, dans la pièce. Euh, un laboratoire où j'ai moi-même passé euh, un, un peu de temps. Or, il y a deux ans, donc durant l'été 2016, euh, nous nous y sommes rencontrés et euh, est née l'idée de, de faire un projet de laboratoire mixte de recherche entre le CNRS et l'Université de Berkeley sur le thème de l'univers sombre. Euh, Pierre était enthousiaste pour ce projet et donc nous avons esquissé un projet basé sur l'idée de, de rassembler dans une même unité de recherche, dans un même laboratoire, euh, des équipes euh, mixtes franco-américaines euh, travaillant sur la matière noire, sur l'énergie noire, sur le rayonnement primordial, sur les ondes gravitationnelles même, qui à l'époque, euh, dont on parlait fortement évidemment à l'époque, euh, on commençait à parler beaucoup, euh, et sur euh, les théories euh, associées. Donc mon idée, bien sûr, c'était que Pierre dirigerait ce laboratoire euh, et porterait, comme il l'a fait pour la PC, euh, son, ce laboratoire au plus haut niveau international. Bon, bien sûr, Pierre n'a pas pu mener cette tâche au bout, mais je suis heureux d'annoncer qu'aujourd'hui, nous allons euh, continuer, enfin, nous continuons à travailler sur ce projet et nous allons le faire aboutir. Euh, le CNRS, d'une part, et l'Université de Berkeley sont euh, enthousiastes pour le projet. On a maintenant identifié un porteur, qui est en fait un chercheur de ce laboratoire, Radex Stompor, et qui, avec l'aide de Nicolas Arignot, du LPNHE, est en train d'assembler une équipe donc, de, de chercheurs euh, euh, français et américains euh, qui euh, donc, vont euh, se mettre en, en route et en mouvement pour, euh, pour faire ce projet. Côté euh, américain, le porteur sera Saul Permuter. Et donc ce laboratoire qui doit euh, beaucoup à Pierre, euh, en fait, euh, nous avons décidé, nous allons l'appeler le centre Pierre Minetri, donc euh, Pierre Minetri Center. Voilà, donc je crois que Pierre aurait été content de voir que ce projet continue et euh, je vous remercie pour euh, votre attention. Uh, I will say a few words about uh, the, the birth of APC, which is the, a birth which lasted for six years between 1999 and 2006. And I will uh, explain the key role of Pierre in the creation of this new laboratory. So to create a new laboratory, you need a scientific project. You need people, scientists, but also ITA. In, this is the French acronym for engineers, technicians, and administrative people. You need offices and workshops, and you need money. So all this is necessary to create a laboratory. Is it a long, steady river? I am not sure. It's a long, steady river with white waters. And Pierre has been a real captain in this affair. So the first is that from spring 1997, informal discussions in the Paris area community devoted to the so-called so astroparticle and cosmology, Pierre was already involved at this time. The first important meeting uh, held on uh, February 2, 1999. The second point is that uh, following uh, asbestos removal on the Jussieu site, the University of Paris 7 is looking for a new campus to welcome uh, most of its units scattered all over Paris. And Luc Valentin, that you uh, heard yesterday, head of the UFR de Physique, the physics department, take this opportunity to completely refound the physics at Paris 7. So uh, personally, I think that the, the key date for this is the 28th September 1999. This is the first meeting organized by Luc Valentin after the, the presidents of the University of Paris 7, and uh, this time it was Michel Lelamar, had confirmed that the first constru constructions construction stage of the Paris 7 on the Zach Tolbiac, this is what was called at this time, should be achieved in 2003. <coughs> Initially, only the pole, matière complexe, was planned, 
and it has been decided that the pole astroparticle and cosmology would be part of the first constru construction stage. So all the installated people will meet on the, this day, Tuesday, uh, 28th of September, in uh, Jussieu, and 65 people attended the meeting. So at this meeting, five working groups were created, uh, High Energy Astrophysics, uh, by, edited by Jacques Paul, Observational Cosmology by Yannick Giroiro, Theory by Pierre, Neutrinos by uh, Hervé de Keret, and uh, the Moyen Technique by uh, Gérard Tristram. So the first APC Triumvirat uh, was uh, during two years, about two years, uh, it was Pierre, uh, Yannick, and Jacques Paul who conducted the, this, uh, the, the, this affair. So between uh, September 99 and spring 2001, they led the discussions with all the authorities. All the authorities, Michel Delamar, the president of Paris 7, Geneviève, Geneviève de Bouzy for CNRS INSU, Michel Spiro, who, who, who was at this time at CNRS IN2P3, but then he went to Saclay and came back to IN2P3. Stavros Katsanevas, uh, uh, Joël Feltes for CEO after Michel Spiro, Pierre Couturier, Observatoire de Paris, and many other people. So this was a lot of discussions with many authorities. And in the spring 2001, this is the date where Pierre is considered as the future director of this uh, new laboratory. So another important meeting which took place in 2000, this was a meeting in uh, Larry Brasier Hospital, which was called Informal Audit. So this is uh, organized by the, university, the UFR de Physique of the University Paris Diderot, uh, with the, the, the bodies CEA, CNRS, and also the Ministry of the uh, Enseignement Supérieur et de la Recherche. This was the, was the presentation of the new laboratories of the UFR de Physique were presented. There were a lot of people, a lot of important people. And at this uh, meeting, this was the presentation of the APC founding document. So in this document, there, were, there was already the, the structure of APC, which has evolved, but not so, not so much. So there were three uh, areas, high energy astrophysics, cosmology and gravitations, and neutrinos, but also transverse uh, domains, theory, which covers all this, data processing, and also uh, research and development, R&D. So this, is, this was the structure which is uh, the, the core of the, of the uh, department, of the, of the future lab. So before the lab is arriving, from January 2002, there was the so-called Federation de Recherche APC. And then to have some money, it was completed by a plan pluriformation, which was something given by the ministry to, uh, for, for uh, starting uh, laboratories. It was planned for three years, 2002, 2003, 2004. It has been presented uh, in July 2001 to the supervisory bodies, and the, there was a very warm welcome. The Federation will work, no problem, but it will never be signed by the bodies, because when you have all these bodies, CA, CNRS, University Paris Hydro, Observatoire de Paris, College de France, it's very complicated that all these people agree on the terms which are in the text. So there were a lot of meetings, a lot of mail exchanges, and uh, f finally the Federation worked, but it has never been signed by these uh, people. It doesn't matter. So Pierre was the director of the, uh, of the Federa Federation, and I was the deputy director of this. There was a Conseil de Federation with 15 people which covered all the areas in, the, in this uh, uh, domain. And there was also a, a Conseil Scientifique, which was international, with some people like Christian Spiering, Franz von Feilich, Giovanni Bignami, and Joe Silk. Already in the pro experimental program at this time, we, we, you find some of the, uh, of the experiments which are still uh, in act which, which were uh, important at this time. Planck uh, in the cosmology, so glassed uh, and then Fermi, uh, and S uh, for uh, high energy, uh, 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 high energy um, gamma rays. And uh, there was OG, in which the lab played an important role at this time, and the uh, forthcoming ESO. Also, Antares was there, and for neutrinos, Borexino, and things which were to be defined. Double show was not yet in the, uh, in the paysage at this time. Uh, just I mentioned at the end, Lisa was already mentioned, but with uh, three question marks because it was not 
It was just an idea at this time that the lab would enter in, in LISA. But it was in 2002. <coughs> so 2003, 2004, towards the laboratory, APC, laboratory in uh, French, uh, it's uh, called UMA, Unité Mixte de Recherche. The main site was the uh, Collège de France, but there were some offices in Jussieu, other people in Saclay, Orsay, uh, Institute Astrophysique, or Meudon. It was not easy to create a real life. However, there were scientific discussions. A new team, the gravitation, appears with LISA. Uh, then uh, premonitory Virgo, uh, this was uh, not clear at this time that Virgo would, uh, would provide the important results so soon. Specific colloquia were organized and development of new projects beyond the initial program. Some people followed, some people, uh, some others arrived, some people do not follow, some people arrived, so there were some, uh, the core was there, but there, there have been some movements, which is normal in this uh, situation of a laboratory, which has no walls uh, at this time. There were Journées du Labo, which were organized in Dieppe, in Dourdan, in uh, Amboise, uh, for the three years. And the, the preparation of the UMR contract document was uh, for 1st of January 2005. There were also the discussions on the repartition of the of forthcoming offices in the new physics building between the three new labs, which was not an easy task, uh, and also the need to structure the new laboratory with the structure matrix with the, in the physics and also in the techniques part. Pierre was not alone, but followed closely all the steps and difficulties in uh, organizing this, uh, these new labs. So just a few words about the official contract document, two years of discussions. On the 13 October 2002, 2003, there was the first preliminary version which was uh, presented at the university. In November, the definitive version is presented to the ministry, and then it was examined by the Comité National de CNRS, all the sections 2, 3, 14, 47, so this was a lot of bodies which were implied. Between March and November, there were navets between Ministry, University, and CNRS, so this was also a complicated thing. And in 1st January 2005, this was the start, the official start of the UMR APC with Pierre as director. In 2003, it is anticipated that the move in the new building will be in summer 2005. <laughs> this was a dream. The offices and workshops it's a long story uh, towards the Bâtiment Condorcet, which is close to this building. In September 2000, the Cahier des Charges is ready. 2001, the University Paris 7, there is the Concours d'Architecture, which is launched for the two buildings, for physics and biology. In January 2002, the project is retained for the physics. And uh, in April, uh, in April uh, 2000, between April 2003 and 2004, this is still a terrain vague, which is the picture on the right. Fall 2004 is the start of the construction. construction. March 2005, the main work is done. And May 2006, the building is finished. The building is finished, but we have not yet the authorization to enter in the building. However, in this time, on the 1st January 2005, astroparticle and cosmology announce you the birth of APC. But this uh, birth was not so easy because Pierre and also the people in the lab had to fight for many, he had to fight because there were all these bodies, ministères, CIA, CNRS, University Paris d'Hydro, Observatoire de Paris, Collège de France, uh, on many topics. To obtain money, to obtain offices, to obtain workshops, to obtain new researchers, new ITA to discuss the contractualizations, to discuss the new building and how to enter in the new building, and also to face to growing internal discontent sometimes. You know that the people are not happy that uh, the situation uh, is uh, like this. Even a theorist can do it. And on uh, May uh, 2006, there was the scientific inauguration of APC at the BNF, close to, 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 to this place. This was a two-day meeting that Pierre uh, uh, wanted and organized very well. Uh, the first day, 200 people, uh, and there were a lot of talks that uh, you have the list of the people working here. And uh, on the May 6, uh, there was the, the conferences on astroparticle and cosmology, 
which uh, were attended by about 600 people, uh, in which there were talks by uh, uh, Gabriele Veneziano that you heard yesterday, Jim Cronin, Jack Paul, and also Stephen Hawking that Pierre uh, succeeded to invite to this, uh, uh, to this uh, inauguration. And I do not resist to the pleasure to show you. Uh, there was a special invitation at the Louvre in the evening uh, wanted by, uh, asked by uh, Stephen Hawking. And there were some uh, physicists uh, which were present to this day. Uh, after the dinner, uh, we had a private uh, visit of the Louvre. Um, and this picture has been taken uh, in front of the Jericho uh, tableau, which is the Rado de la Meduse. Uh, we don't hope that this was premonitory for the APC uh, success in the, in the future. Unfortunately, unfortunately, on this uh, uh, completely surrealist picture, Pierre is just behind uh, Jim Cronin because the, the people who took the picture did not attend that the people were looking at the photograph. June 2006, the fight is not finished. Even after the inauguration of IPC, IPC is still virtual. The administrator of Collège de France wants the people leave the building immediately. The safety authorities do not allow that people enter in the new building. The university wants to give part of the offices dedicated to APC to the chemists who have to leave Jussieu. So it was not easy. October 17, Pierre leads a street process in front of the offices of the president of the university. By chance, uh, it happened that uh, after this uh, street uh, meeting, uh, in December 2006, the first people can enter in the new building of the F FR de Physique, and in March 2007, the installation is done. So the role of Pierre has been determinant. He knew precisely in what direction the new lab should go. Even if, was, if it was not always easy to work with him, as it has been said yesterday, he was doing so many things and was not always accessible. He had a clever and long-term scientific vision for the baby APC. He had a unique ability to convince the, superis the supervisory bodies and to different projects in which he believed. Surprisingly, as a pure theorist, he got very quickly into the skin of the director of an experimental physics laboratory. Pierre has driven the APC baby to the adolescence and adulthood until end of 2013. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, I know, I knew the, the moment he's parting uh, for 41 years. As Louis said, uh, uh, we met at the DEA together with Guy, with Satiris and, uh, and, and Louis. And uh, we worked in parallel and in collaboration for many years and still remember. Actually, you mentioned the asbestos uh, thing. I remember that during the DOA, we were one of the DOA that almost made a strike against the asbestos in the Jussieu. And we said that we should leave Jussieu and go elsewhere. So we were fighting for APC many years before, uh, back in 74, uh, uh, for, uh, in some sense. Uh, well, it's a private joke. Now, uh, I, I try, essentially what I would like to, to show is, uh, uh, you know, again, show historically some of the major things of uh, Pierre, also set a little bit the agenda for what we'll hear, because all of the things we'll hear are people that are uh, important in their fields and which contributed to, to, this, uh, to these openings that also Pierre worked. And uh, some of them, for instance, uh, Fabiola Gianotti, we wanted to come and finally did not manage, as Louis said. Also, Saul Perlmutter. And we managed also to have from Barry Barish uh, a video that will show uh, around 2 o'clock. So uh, I tried to, you know, to just organize what I would like very fast to, to organize our reminiscences of the person. Uh, is use the, the thing you liked a lot. You'll, hear, you'll see in the film the, the concept of the horizon and the paradox, the well-known paradoxes of the horizon. And uh, yeah, I put there a French uh, uh, saying by Victor Segalin, uh, where it uh, shows that a horizon is, uh, is full of paradoxes, not only for uh, uh, science, but also for art. And uh, it hides things. And uh, it is a definition. Horizon actually comes from the Greek word orizo, which means define. It's a definition. Horizon is always a definition. 
And as I will say in the next slide, if I remember correctly, Wittgenstein said that you realize the boundaries, the horizon, only when you cross them, when you go through. So you have to walk, you have to, to extend, and this is where you see the horizons coming up. And this is also, the horizon always is related to movement. And this, actually, uh, the fact that uh, Pierre was very interested about horizons is uh, proven by, he organized the questions of uh, horizon in 2014. And there were a lot of uh, science talk, of course, about uh, gravitation and uh, the horizon problems, but also artists. Unfortunately, the philosopher, uh, a dear friend of Pierre and mine that uh, was there, Céline Flecher, could not come. So uh, she, we also heard uh, about horizon in painting, or horizon in philosophy and literature. So these horizons, these boundaries that uh, Pierre tried to cross, and crossed actually, that's how he understood that there were boundaries, was, it has been a lot of talk about it, the, the boundary between theory and praxis. So we were not, in France, we were not like in Italy, where there is a very close relationship between the theorists and the experimentalists. Some theorists tended to be more theoretical, mathematical, and our experimentalists uh, more on their side. And the GDR Susi, for me, was the first, the unique and real convergence between theories and, and experimentalists. It has been said, I would like only to, to, repeat, it, to repeat it. And this was, it was a fantastic time for all of us, I think. Uh, that's, I have to repeat that, although it has been presented very well. Then uh, around 2004, so let me start showing these things. I will not go again to show this, uh, this thing. Uh, uh, le around 2004, uh, he crossed the boundary of space. Boundary of space was being crossed by others uh, a long time before. But for INTP3 and the, the national organization of, uh, of space studies, for instance, CNES, it was a difficult passage. It was not, it was plank. We have to say, and there Yannick had a big role, and of course other people, uh, Francois and uh, in Lal and, uh, and uh, other people in, uh, in Grenoble uh, about Planck. That was the first space mission we had. But we were there, but really start being part of the CNES program was a very, it was not yet a, a standard thing. So uh, Stefan, I don't want to sc scoop Stefan, so I mentioned that at some point, he sent me, a few months ago, he sent me his first contact with Pierre, which you see the date is 26 February of 2004, where he says, I'm, APC will be created, please I want to discuss later. So he contacted me, I was at the direction of NTP3 at the time, and we took Stefano to a, a Greek restaurant in uh, Cartier Latin. And even there we, were, we had pre-science because it got his first uh, star Michelin uh, last month. So it was, we, we, knew, we knew the future, we knew, I mean, uh, and it, went, it was fantastic. It's, we still all remember this, you know, the warmth of the thing that uh, we said we, we, something was starting. Many things happened in between. And there I also put some mail by Richard Bonville, who, to whom uh, this is a carence. We did not, uh, we didn't think to invite, and that's a, a very bad thing. Uh, 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 who played a huge role into understanding how the engineering power and the uh, make, making uh, power of uh, INTP3 was important for CNES, and he was uh, one who supported a lot the inclusion of, uh, proper inclusion of INTP3 into the CNES structure, you know, national. But I have to say, the, the, we met uh, Bonneville, we discussed, with, we took him to the same restaurant, he was working, so we went to the same restaurant, it happened all because of Lisa. That's, that's, so that's where I, I would like to, to, to put it there with you. Then there is the famous inauguration. I mean, he, uh, I would like to show, you have it in, in our lab, no. Unfortunately, I cannot show that. Anyway, you will have it in, uh, in the slides, the talks. I mean, uh, uh, Daniel talked about them. You have many people there. You have also, Someone, uh, we spoke about the people who departed uh, from the particle physics side, but we, have also, we had also Giovanni uh, Bignami, who was, uh, gave a fantastic talk. We had Hawking, we had, of course, uh, and other people that I, I don't want to, to go to because it's too touching. We also lost, uh, he was not talking at this, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, at this inauguration, it was Nils Gerals. We've lost also this uh, approximately the same time as Pierre. So people are leaving. Uh, so we have to, to take uh, stock of that. Uh, and I, uh, something I remember from that, which is always very funny, is that some of us have been assigned by Pierre the task, the following task. It was a huge event. The next day it was written, because of Hawking, it was written even in the, in the Bangladesh news, in the uh, Bombay, the APC was inaugurated. It was a big event. So a lot of people. And therefore it attracted the, uh, what we have here, the Frere Bogdanov. They came, the, these are two guys from the TV, that, uh, and they came with their camera. And their, their, their main project was to approach Hawking and pretend they are talking to Hawking, imagine. So we had, uh, had shifts, how to be between the camera, the Frere Bogdanov and Hawking, how to protect uh, the passage to it. So I spent uh, half an hour or so protecting Hawking from the Frere Bogdanov as others from this lab. This is it. a very dear memory. I think I protected science uh, very efficiently this day. Then, yes, we presented the, I think I take the authority of the, I propose that we'll go to the, uh, to, to, in, the, in the museum to be in front of the Medusa because I interpret it differently. And uh, yesterday I saw it with a new light. You know, there is this philosopher, Sloterdijk, who says uh, the evolutionary necessity to create always a ring of protection around the fragile, the mother and the child, for instance, addressing a clearing, Lichtung in German, it looks much more important, to keep away the animals who already form big teeth, permitting thus neoteny, the newborn, because innovation is weak when it is created, and the already animals are you know, can eat it unless you protect it. And that was the role of, of I think, of Pierre. And I found the same words in, in the presentation of the manuscript when he said, my manuscript, my PhD is a weak baby and you, the fairies, Nanny and Susie, protect it while it was being born. So it was, it was a very, very, very touching for me to, to, to hear that. By the way, he was calling all the people that were in the the, the important people that were at the, at the meeting, he called them fairies, the fairies over the birth of APC. He was telling me always of you, of Angela, of, of many people. We, 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 you see, uh, we, we have been shown already by, by Daniel as the fairies overlooking the birth. So it was everything fits at the end. This picture has been shown, and uh, so again, I don't stay with that. I have a clearer picture. This one, so again, you see the people, and something you will remark is we don't look in the same direction. <laughs> it was the state of Asovatical at the time, and it probably still is, but we were looking, everybody's looking, at, there was never, the picture where we look at the camera never happened for some reason. And again, this is an occasion to present something I always uh, say, forgive for the people that have uh, heard it already, of another philosopher, Blumenberg, who says, an interdisciplinary enterprise must assume for some time a lesser precision than this claimed by canonical branches of learning. Among the particularities of these canonical branches is the fact that they are comforted in their self-sufficiency by claim always a larger precision than what is reasonable to expect, and anyway, they have obtained this precision by isolating and diminishing the size of the object under study without any theoretical counterpart. Since it does not accept the well-defined delimitation of its object, interdisciplinarity starts by giving a slight impression of deception. And this is what we, what we were at the time, and we are not anymore, I hope. So, another thing that I, I have to add to that is that uh, Hawking asked us to put him in front of the, uh, of the uh, Mona Lisa uh, portrait. And we left him alone there for some time, and he stood. Now, here is a picture with Jim. We're a little bit late. Again, we don't have this picture. I tried. We don't have this picture. And then I wrote somewhere it is the the you know the meeting of the two enigmatic smiles, these of art with this of science. I let you think more. About, I don't want to send more about that. In parallel. <clears throat> what was happening in Europe is that exactly the same dates, 2005, 2006, 
we had this uh, 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 program, uh, the European Union, ASPERA, that was approved uh, and uh, was, uh, uh, the leadership was here in France. And, uh, uh, and uh, we made the scientific vision. And the scientific vision uh, came up around 2008. And see, we had seven big themes and there was a big discussion whether there are seven or nine. And in the nine, there was also the cosmological background and dark energy well, already. And the person that was fighting for that uh, was Pierre. Pierre. Pierre put, because he was already at the scientific advisory committee, he said, you should put in cosmology, should put dark energy. And we did not put. Why? Because it was only in France at the time that this, this uh, convergence was happening. In other agencies that were forming uh, APEC at the time, they did not. So there were a lot, there is, if you read the text, there, is, there are pages on that, but we didn't put it on the seven. So we took it out as a seven. You have here the Nature article, uh, two pages at the time. Uh, this is the picture that accompanied that, is Jules Brenner and all that. And uh, this was a big discussion, I told you. And again, there you can find a metaphor. Uh, it had a large uh, media impact. And the subliminal message is, again, protection of a small village while it is formed against organized crime. It's a little bit more. Uh, uh, and then at the time, I, I always like to remind, there was a, document, a, a comment coming from a very important person, a very friendly to us, it was not a hostile comment. Great, your seven magnificent, they're great, but at least five of them have not seen a signal yet. Where are you going? Well, it's not the case anymore. We have at least two that have seen a signal, even a source from what we understand. Uh, I'm not talking about gravitational waves here. So he was, Pierre was a member of the APEC SAC uh, from 2005, from the inception of it to the end of his life. And you have here images of him. Uh, again, the famous always uh, 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 face, uh, uh, his young, uh, youthful uh, face, together with another big personality, Rubia, uh, whom, again, I give my salutations to here. And then in 2010, we had, uh, and uh, uh, Pierre made a big role into that, of course, we had uh, George, who honored us of coming here already after his Nobel Prize uh, reception. In, uh, he, he was tied to us. He came to us uh, to, uh, to, to celebrate his Nobel Prize with us uh, in 2006 already. And uh, then he came and they founded uh, with uh, Pierre the uh, Paris Center for Cosmological Physics. I don't, will not go through this. You've heard that. You go and you put uh, Smoot, uh, PCCP, and then you find in the French paper a big impact already. Then, 2011, the frontier, the over, I mean, I mean, Vanner Bush, uh, ba Bush, how was it? Vanner, I forget the name. The ever, it was the famous NSF document, the ever receding frontier. The other frontier that was also, and we did not talk, but uh, Antoine will talk towards the end, was the interface between geosciences and astroparticle physics. It's an, again uh, uh, an interface we're working on very hardly these days. And again, uh, one uh, founding uh, uh, thing that, uh, uh, that Pierre did, uh, together with the colleagues from AIM and uh, the Institute of Physics of the Globe, they were successful in obtaining funds for a laboratory of actionals called Universe. And he, there I have my type of uh, sort of uh, uh, presentation of, the, of uh, why this happens. Because for astroparticle, the geosphere is both a target and detecting medium, continuous times, time series data, deploying large sensor networks in hostile environments, sea, desert, underground, uh, low intensity geological effects, metrology, large data manipulation alerts. This convergence between uh, a, a Paris 7 lab and the Institute of the Physics of the Globe it was a, a central motor in the current fusion of universities between Descartes, Diderot, and PGP. Here I have another thing I show often from the uh, frontispiece of Tycho Brahe, 
where you see it says when I'm looking up, in fact I'm looking down, and when I'm looking down, in fact I'm looking up. In Latin, suspiciendo despicio et despiciendo suspicio. An example I have, I don't want again to scoop uh, uh, Antoine, is the recent how you use gravitational wave methods to have uh, uh, early uh, warning alerts, fantastic methods that uh, are happening, one of the products of these conversions. Okay, coming to the two last slides, we talked a lot about uh, yesterday about our, uh, music and uh, music and, uh, and Pierre. Also, the modern art, the you know the visual arts were, or performance arts, whatever we call it, were also something that was very close to Pierre. And uh, this uh, with uh, Jean-Luc, who must be somewhere here, of course. Uh, around 2009, between I2P3 and APC, we thought to celebrate the 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 day of the, it was the year of astronomy by celebrating the Thomas Wolff cosmic ray experiment at the Eiffel Tower. So we went there, we, Jean-Luc proposed to them, and they said yes, and we were excited, but then she called us back, they said no, 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 in fact, no, we don't. Two reasons, first, the tourists will think that only the Eiffel Tower uh, attracts cosmic rays, and so therefore they will not go, and then how do you explain cosmic rays and all the batomouche that pass in front of it? So they wouldn't uh, ask us, because of course the, the concept was that we would have at the top of the Eiffel Tower a cosmic ray detector, each time there would be a cosmic ray, it would be a, a green laser light that would shine. So we were not permitted, we went to the Montparnasse and it happened very well. And uh, it was Jim also had a, a conference there, but a, a teleconference, but still a conference there, Jim Cronin. It was a fantastic uh, week. Uh, but afterwards where I really understood what happened Actually, Sarkozy had promised the same uh, week uh, to Erdogan that it will be a Turkey-France week, and so it was painted in red from the Turkish flag, but never mind. And so we did this with the, with the uh, laser, and I said to John, uh, to Yanis Siliopoulos, did you like it? He said, yes, but it looked a little bit like a disco. So, <laughs> so we explained this to our artist friend, Poggi, here, and he said, yes, you don't do conceptually, uh, conceptual art, and the, you don't have to illustrate cosmic rays. You have to go deeper. And he has had us meet uh, this uh, fantastic artist called uh, uh, Attila Sorgo, and he created the squaring the circle that invite you if during, the, uh, dinner, uh, during lunch if you want to visit with us, uh, if you have not seen it already, where you have a source of light on a circle and its projection on the Earth is a, is a square. So this is for, for him squaring the circle. Actually, his first idea was to make it kinetic, that it would be square waves. Have, you had a drop of water and the waves would be square. Told him, no, you cannot do it. He said, no, 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 I have done it in my bathtub. And, well, finally, he didn't do it. And you can see the impact again the, uh, the Astroparticle International Forum when it met at IPC took a picture around it, and it is included in the new APEC roadmap. That was one, and then uh, among the last years, finally 2016, he managed to obtain uh, funds from the Foundation Carasso between Art and Science, and the, I mean, I, this again, this is my summary of a very big text. The aim of this project is to initiate an exploration through cross-reflection between artists and scientists of the field that began with the recent discovery of gravitational waves, urgently questioning again the nature of space and time, texture, the notion of origin and horizon, the role of information circulating in the universe and its conservation or loss, the role of the human as observer or perturbator, or more generally, the nature of our unbending in the cosmos. In short, the overall image of gravitational universe on US 2.0. They are fantastic artists, I will not name them, that are participating, some of them with well, big uh, retrospectives uh, appearing uh, sh soon at the Palais de Tokyo and things like that. So very high, a lot of name philosophers and people like that. I took it over from him, so these people, the artists in residence now will be coming to Pisa and elsewhere. So I hear again a phrase about, uh, uh, by Frank Oppenheimer, the friend, the brother of the other one, and, uh, and uh, of course, initiator of the Exploratorium, San Francisco, who said, artists and scientists are the world's noticers. Their job is simply to notice what other people cannot. 
or there are two things that are people are surrounded by and avoid trying to understand. One is music and the other is electricity. So again, this is about the music and the Pierre. So last picture is again from our visit, when we visited uh, the Calder in Tour, we visited uh, Sorgo to discuss about uh, this, uh, this work of art, the squaring the circle. It's a picture of, of Pierre in front of, uh, of, uh, of a road. And um, I took it, and so I think it's uh, fit uh, for the ending slide. And it reminds me again of uh, the Odyssey. It's well known that Teresia is when uh, Ulysses goes down in the Nekia, in the down in the underworld. Uh, he asks him, "What will happen to me after when I go after I go home?" He says, "After when you go home, you'll stay for a little while, but a little while, but you will not stay for long." your appetite for travel is so hard that you will go again, will leave, and you start a second Odyssey. Till you meet people that do not know what a roaming paddle is, therefore they don't know the sea. Yesterday, I said it could be a ski paddle, could be ski. It is only then that you should stop wandering and uh, make a sacrifice to Poseidon. And that would be, uh, would be your absolution. So thank you very much. For um, I had met, of course, Pierre, and we were quite close together. I met him as a student when he was a student, and uh, later he was teaching in the the in the graduate course of in theoretical physics that I. Uh, was responsible, and uh, that was Nicole Normal, and uh, as um, evidence of what has been said already for his teaching um, uh, abilities, uh, in Nicole Normal we had um, um, rating, which is secret, I don't put it in. It's a correlation between the person who teaches the and the, in the senior year, the last undergraduate uh, year, uh, who teaches the course of uh, particle physics, and uh, the number of uh, students that choose particle physics later. And uh, uh, I can say that Pierre was scoring very high in that. He was very successful in inspiring uh, young students. So. Um, I was asked to talk today. I'm the first of uh, the futurologists, uh, people who will talk about future. And uh, but before, let me. Well, th this is a very beautiful picture. I had some others, but I think this one was, was the best I found in uh, whoever found it very beautiful. Um, Pierre left us in uh, April. It's now a year, April 2017. Uh, he was fully active until the last moment, um, both in, uh, in uh, research, but also in all his other activities. Uh, he was a member of the LISA Pathfinder collaboration, so if you look at the papers of the collaboration, his name appears in the papers, but he was also uh, active in theory, so there are several articles in which he had collaborated and which appeared after his death. And uh, I have a few here. Um, well, you don't have to go through them. So he was active, and you see from the submission dates that he was very active until the last moments. Uh, so today I have to talk about the future of particle physics and uh, you understand from what I said that um, uh, Pierre was much younger and um, I had known him as a student. So I have the feeling that standing here and talking in a conference which is memorial to him is something like something contrary to the laws of nature that has happened. It should have been the other way around, in some sense. And um, this is true in um, 
many, not only chronologically, but also for the subject. I'm sure that uh, Pierre would have given this talk, the future of particle physics, would have given a much better talk than I could give, because he had thought about this um, subject much more than I have. Anyway, in uh, life things don't happen always in their natural order. So here I am and I will talk about the future of um, particle physics. And um, I have noticed the, in many conferences people ask somebody to talk about the future of something or other. And I have noticed that in most cases um, the speaker spends most of his time talking about the past and uh, then he runs out of time when he comes to the to talk about the future and uh, now i understand the reasons for that um, you don't have any so i will start with the past um, with the discovery of the bh scalar boson the standard model is complete it's no more the standard model. I think it's a mistake to call it that way, although it is, a, it is the standard theory. It's not a model anymore. It is the theory of the um, fundamental interactions as we know. So this is the standard theory. It has been enormously successful. It contains uh, 17 plus because it depends, depends whether you put the neutrino parameters inside the model or not, and whatever other parameters you can put. Anyway, it contains many parameters, arbitrary parameters, but they are all masses and coupling constants. And uh, two things we know about this thing. First of all, they have been determined experimentally. <coughs> masses and coupling constants, you measure them one way or another. Coupling constants, you measure what you define, somebody else may define them differently, but one definition is related to the other. There is only one measurement that you need to make. So they have been all determined experimentally. Uh, and this number is irreducible. You cannot find inside the standard model, unless you enlarge the model, you cannot have a relation of the form um, uh, lam for example, one coupling constant as a function of the other coupling constants. And because of this relation wouldn't be respected by renormalization, it not, does not correspond to a fixed point uh, thing. So somehow, f for reasons we do not understand, the standard theory is the absolute totalitarian system. Whatever is not forbidden is compulsory. There is no possibility to play around. And this is, I will come back, it's a strange feature which obviously we want to go beyond and we don't, we are not really there yet. So, well, as I say, I will talk about the past. So our confidence in this theory is fully justified by its successes in predicting new phenomena and its impressive agreement with experiment, both. New phenomena, well, weak list, weak neutral currents. I remind the young people that when the model was um, uh, written, its main weakness was that it predicted weak neutral currents. And everybody knew that weak neutral currents did not exist. Right? So they were discovered by the Gargamel collaboration. And uh, this was the first real success, the first real hardcore evidence that with gauge theories we were in the right track. Right. The discovery of charged particles. Uh, again, I can tell you that uh, the, uh, when we were saying that there was a fourth species of quarks, I can name famous physicists that were telling me that uh, this is just nonsense. And it's not weak interactions that will tell us how many quarks we have. They were discovered. Uh, the discovery of QCD, this is um, a data-driven 
discovery because the um, scaling uh, properties in uh, deep inelastic uh, electron uh, nuclear scattering were discovered before their uh, <coughs> fundamental significance, uh, theoretical significance was understood. So, uh, the discovery of gauge bosons, obviously, right, uh, with those masses that. Uh, um, in fact, the discovery of intermediate vector bosons was in the list of topics of all neutrino experiments that had, have ever been done. The first neutrino experiment we have, and, um, if you look at the topics that they had, uh, the um, uh, discovery of uh, intermediate vector bosons was an important point in the thing, and uh, the same in uh, CERN. In fact, at CERN, the second neutrino experiment, uh, the, f the first at CERN, but the one after Brookhaven, uh, for some time people had claimed the discovery of, um, of um, uh, intermediate vector bosons. <laughs> they were seeing something, probably charmed particles, but they could not interpret them right at that time. Um, the discovery of B and T flavors which was again part of the model because once you have the top, the, the tau lepton, you know that you must have the um, uh, corresponding quarks. So this was um, again a great discovery. And of course, the discovery of the uh, B, BH boson at CERN 2012. So these are new phenomena that have been predicted or say, accompanied by the theory in, um, uh, from the standard theory, and they were verified experimentally. Uh, in addition, it shows an impressive agreement with the experiment in a very large number of detailed measurements. You have all those um, 17 parameters which you measure, but once you measure them, then you can make all sorts of other measurements, right? And for for the first time, you can both compute the um, theoretically the answer and measure the and you know I mean I will go very fast. There are so many that well this is a very impressive p picture which we often leave out in the when we talk about the standard model we concentrate on the electroweak sector but in fact the standard model is. The QCD is part of it, and even when we compare now the um, the results of electroweak measurements, we need the strong interaction to compute the thing. All the, it's very important to have the entire picture. Right. So this is a very impressive set of uh, measurements, as you can see, which covers many decades of the of um, uh, um, Q squares. Uh, these are the uh, uh, pro uh, production cross-sections. These are from Atlas. There is a similar one from CMS. And you, have, you see how many quantities you have here. I mean, you don't have to go through all of them. But uh, this is an in incredible amount of data that we have accumulated and they work. Um, uh, again, here are these... Um, famous asymmetries that you have seen many times, uh, same things here. Um, th often they present, the uh, people present this um, uh, piece of part of the data. This is only part of the data, right? Uh, these ones here, there are many more. But they present them as, say, pulls away from the standard model predictions. And you see that there are some measurements that are, say, two standard deviations of, but um, most of uh, the agreement is impressive, and I'm not sure that these two standard, how important these two standard deviations are in these particular measurements. Uh, so everything seems to work very well. Uh, by the way, these are the only data I will show which are really non, uh, non-perturbative, so these are results from the from lattice uh, simulations from QCD, and you see the low lying uh, hadron uh, states, and the agreement is really impressive. Again, you 
see how many. So it's not just perturbation theory. We have also pieces of evidence that go beyond perturbation theory that work very well. Now, most of these successes, however, constitute, in fact, a triumph for normalized perturbation theory. And now, let me make a, a theoretical remark. We don't really understand why the perturbation theory works so well. It's a, it's a miracle. Um, for the first time, we check weak interactions at the level of radiative corrections. And the standard theory has become a high precision theory. It's not enough to have, say, some prediction 10% off. I mean, 10% is huge most, in most cases. So we have to have about something that we used only for QED until now. And now we can go even to the other things. Right? Well, this is the Altarelli variables and, uh, well, they are defined so that they are sensitive. It does matter the precise definition of e e epsilon 1 and epsilon 3. They are quantities that are defined so that they take away radiative corrections, uh, QED, say electromagnetic and strong, and they are sensitive only to weak interaction radiative corrections. If you take weak interactions at the tree level, then these values are zero. So the, the tree level prediction is somewhere down here. Right? And these are the standard model prediction and the things. So you are far away from, from zero. That means really you are sensitive to weak interaction radiative corrections. Now this is the thing I wanted to say about uh, perturbation theory. Um, normally you expect the following thing. If you have a uh, quantum field theory, you have a weak coupling regime. G, the coupling constant, much smaller than 1. Say QED is in, in that class, obviously, right? So you expect perturbation expansions to be reliable. I say you expect. I do not mean that you can prove they are reliable. The fact that the coupling constant is small does not mean that an expansion is is, but naively you say it may be reliable, right? Then you have, um, because you don't know anything about the convergence of the series, so it does not mean that, uh, yeah. <laughs> then you have strong coupling regime, G larger or equal to one, and then you, obviously perturbation expansions are not reliable, but you expect other methods, strong coupling expansions, or say lattice, uh, to be reliable. Right, And then you normally you expect to have some gray area, which is, say, g of order of, say, one-tenth or one-fifth or something, in which normally you expect no expansion to be reliable. Right? So this is the, now in the present, for a large part of present energies, QCD is in the gray area. I remind you the, the curve about the coupling constant, alpha s, and then if you go to relatively small, say, around 10 GeV Q square, alpha s is not, uh, is not small. It's uh, between one-fifth and one. So you would expect perturbation theory not to work there. However, uh, uh, there was this famous... Um, Argument, I simplify it a lot. The argument was a little bit more complicated by Dyson, which says the following, says, well, when does perturbation theory break down? Is when the nth order, the nth order term goes roughly like that. Is some number, uh, the coupling constant to the n, and then the, essentially the number of graphs. The number of graphs in perturbation theory grows like some uh, factorial of the order. And this is really the problem with perturbation theory, is that the number of graphs grows much, much too fast. Right? So um, when do you expect the, uh, the uh, perturbation theory to break down? Well, when the nth order term is of the same order of magnitudes as the n plus 1 order term, then you have no perturbation. Then you put that 
into this thing, and you find, you find that for every theory, depending on the value of the coupling constant, this is when the inverse of the coupling constant is of the order of 2 n plus 1, say of the order of 2 n. Right? So for QED, this will give you 65 or something, whatever. So you don't expect to see the breakdown of perturbation theory in QED because you will never compute 65 order terms. But for QCD, why it works so well? And the reason why, in fact, it works so well is that people who have invented very clever um, computational methods, really what they compute in QCD is not naive perturbation theory. It's much more sophisticated and involved perturbation theory, and presumably, without having any mathematical proof for that, they take into account part of this thing. So it's lots of ingenuity uh, from the theorist side which has been invested in, this, uh, in these calculations. So, now, given this impressive, this was the past, as I said, and so I don't have much time now to talk about the future. So, given this impressive success, what does beyond mean? Why do we want to go beyond? Or what is wrong with the standard theory? So why do we want to have that? So there are two things, general questions and specific points, which are, um, I want to point out. There are some specific points, but I'm not able right now to judge their importance. There are a few measurements, which I will go through, which really show a discrepancy which is more than, say, two or three standard deviations, at least taken in face value. So this is the first thing. Now, so let me start with specific points. The first thing was an old thing, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, the G minus 2 of the muon. And here you have the result, the experimental measurement. And consistently, this you see it is the year, consistently the theoretical calculations they become the errors become smaller a little bit but they are there is a disagreement between theory and experiment right and uh, well i don't know how to say it's triple right now it is less than four sigma but it will become more there is a project now to, as you know very soon will reduce the error bars here in fermilab will be like that. And the theories also have do a little bit better in calculations. If this thing persists, it is um, important. We have to think of it. There is, there are, in the theoretical calculations, there are things I do not understand, but I will not uh, go into them now. Uh, here you have the um, various, uh, well, this is the QED, the um, electroweak corrections, but then you have the hadronic, these parts here, right? And then you, you have the leading order next to leading order, then next to next to leading order. And um, for some reason, the next to leading order is much, much smaller in absolute value than the leading order. And, um, uh, well, if you do go through the calculations, the people who have done them. It's a very sophisticated calculations. That's what comes out. And then you have this part here, which is the hadronic part of light by light, the scattering of light by light, the hadronic corrections. And again, these are hard to, to evaluate exactly. And uh, there are now um, uh, new computations uh, and uh, large lattice uh, uh, simulations which try to make it. The trouble is that if you go, if you believe now this result, it does not make the agreement better. You wanted to have it that larger, and uh, anyway, we don't know whether this is important or not. So this is a piece of data which um, somehow we are puzzled with. Then there are the, uh, the heavy flavor, uh, two pieces of evidence in the heavy flavor decays. Um, this is the, um, the um, um, flavor universality violation. You measure the, the 
uh, ratio between the brushing ratios of, uh, D, of B to D or D star to tau and mu. Now, if, of course, in this would be one in, uh, say, three approximation, but then you compute the Q square, so not the same, so you have four factors, you have to go through com a complicated computation. And apparently there is a discrepancy if you put them all together. This is the standard model result, and these are the, the say, four sigma. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I don't want to make any comments there more precise. Uh, Jacques, I see Jacques there, so he can. Is it possible, Jacques, that this point, this uh, green thing goes a little bit down? <laughs> it will ease the tension. <laughs> because this, the green thing is um, L uh, LHCB. The, I mean, this part here. The, it's not green, it's whatever, blue. Blue, light blue, or whatever. is LHCB. If you bring it down uh, a little bit, it will ease the tension. But, uh, well, maybe with more data we shall know more. And the same is with um, flavor changing neutral currents. Again, there are, if you make global fits, you see a rather large disagreement, which depending on the fit can be maybe five, stand five sigmas or 4.5 sigmas. Um, the first one, the previous ones were in three diagrams, so to speak although there are all the corrections I said before, and these, are, these ones are in loop uh, diagrams. Uh, so, summary of B anomalies, uh, here they are. Um, there are many new physics explanations, but I will confess that I don't, I'm not excited with any of them. Leptoquarks or things, I mean, whatever it doesn't seem. I remember, um, um, once T.D. Lee told me that there were, again, there were the old days in which we had most of the data were scattered in, say, strong interaction data, and they were complicated. And there were all these feats with reg pulse 1, reg pulse 2, reg pulse with reg cuts, that's it. And T.D. Lee said, well, if the theory gets so complicated, I better look at the data <laughs> directly. So, again, um, think of something like that. So, um, dark matter searches. For years, we were concentrating on that. Well, since we didn't find much there, we enlarged the spectrum. And now, uh, dark matter could be anything, including nothing. Uh, I mean, you. And there are searches. I mean, the experimental program is beautiful. There are beautiful uh, ideas of measurements and experiments on that. But, uh, well, there is a tension between theory and, um, and experiment. And we don't know how it will go. Uh, neutrino physics. I remind you that there have been four Nobel Prizes on various subjects of neutrino physics, experimental neutrino physics, and this subject is not yet closed, so there is more room here for more discoveries. And here I have a list of what um, um, are the main questions that we can ask and which experiments could answer some of them. And there is a long list, as you see. Uh, anyway, you know that, so I will not go into any details. There are many. The trouble for me is that uh, neutrino masses and oscillations, it's, this was a purely data-driven subject in which theories have not played the major role. Until now, all the previous subjects, most theories were important in predicting phenomena or something. This was purely experimental. So theorists don't, and still don't understand much. Substantial improvement in precision could be expected during the coming years. The significance of, however, of such improvements is not easy to judge. 
even if today God comes and gives me the results of all the, exper the experiments in the five or years to come now, um, I'm not sure I would know what to do with them. Right? Um, so far, no real illumination came from leptons to be combined. You see, the, the, theory, the problem of flavor we have in, uh, in uh, particle physics is we have these three families. They are spread all over the place. Uh, we don't understand what. We have, looking at leptons, we have not learned enough to combine with what we know from hadrons, from quarks, to have a real understanding. And I refer to you to Pierre Ramon's talk yesterday, in which he presented this thing very beautifully, all the uh, ideas we have. And the trouble is that I do not see how this could change in the near future. It's not a question of... So there are more general questions. These are specific points which really the standard model is in tension with experiment, right? More or less important tensions. Some of them may be resolved with better data, some others, some not. Uh, and then you have more general questions, what I say. Why three families? Uh, why this particular group? This is, have you, I mean, these are the simplest algebra as well. U1 is not even an algebra, it's not. Uh, SU2 and SU3 are the simplest algebras you can think of, right? If you look at uh, in the Cartan classification, they are the simplest ones. Why nature choose the most simple algebras? There are ideas, mathematical ideas, why this could happen. Could we put them together with phenomenology and make a real theory? I don't know. But this is an important point. Uh, why so many mass scales? This is something we always say. High hierarchy and fine tuning, this is connected with the mass scales. Uh, unification, we don't see anything yet. Quantum gravity and um, many others you can add. I mean, uh, this is always. This. So there are really general questions. And uh, my conclu conclusions now, I come to conclusions. No coherent picture emerges. I don't see how these things could come together somehow. We were expecting new physics to be around the corner, but we see no corner. There's nothing to come out. The easy answer. We need more data. The two problems. We do not know what kind of data, and they will not come for quite a long time. This is another thing we forget, is that the time scale for the experiments is essentially, somebody said it yesterday, that now takes a lifetime. This is a very important thing. Um, when I said it uh, in another thing, I made this remark, and I said, obviously, we will not convince somebody to start an experiment if he knows that he will not finish it. People remarked to me that uh, when in Middle Ages people were starting a cathedral, they knew very well they would not finish it. A cathedral, to build a cathedral took more than 100 years. And it was the son of the builder of <laughs> the son. So maybe we have to go to this thing. But they will not come for quite a long time, uh, which is a frustrating problem. So now I will go to my personal conclusions, my conclusions. These were general conclusions. The future of particle physics will undoubtedly be bright, but I will not learn the answer. We have a very successful standard theory, and we, and we leave the problem of its completion to the younger generation. We have to admit to that. But now they must do it without care. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give a talk at this meeting. Uh, like the previous Jean, I'm significantly older than, than Pierre, and I also, like him, I 
mourn the death of somebody who is younger than I. I don't think we should mourn the death. I think we should remember Pierre as a, as a very charming, uh, energetic, uh, enthusiastic individual. And uh, that's why I chose this uh, opening picture taken from uh, a Theory Division Christmas party at CERN in 1982. It was actually not when I got to know Pierre, and I'll come back later to the time when I first met him, and I'll also discuss the last time I met him. So I was asked to talk about the future of uh, dark matter searches. Uh, so, uh, like Pierre, I'm, I'm a lover of Susie, uh, and I'm very faithful to my love. So I'll be spending most of my time discussing that. I'll be discussing uh, what we learn about supersymmetry from LHC, direct detection, indirect detection. But I also find, I hope, a little bit of time at the end to discuss a, a crazy idea at the end, which has nothing whatsoever to do with supersymmetry, uh, but may possibly connect with uh, uh, the uh, recent excitement about gravitational waves. Uh, I, I think I would like to encourage people not to be desperate. I, I am not desperately seeking Susie. I'm still seeking Susie, but I think you know, we should be more creative, maybe, in the way in which we pursue it. So uh, Jean has already shown you uh, another version of this slide here, showing uh, all the various different, well, not all the various, a sampling of the various different candidates for, uh, for particle dark matter. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to be uh, focusing on uh, weakly interacting massive particles. I don't have time to discuss uh, all the other possibilities, uh, and I don't have time either to discuss black holes, which, of course, are another very interesting candidate for at least uh, part of the dark matter. So as I said, I'm going to focus on, uh, on WIMPs. And, uh, of course, the starting point for the interest in WIMPs is the fact that uh, they could naturally have the right dark matter density if they weigh between 100 and 1,000 GeV. Uh, this was shown in the slides that we saw yesterday from one of Pierre's papers about the, uh, the freeze-out of massive weakly interacting particles in the early universe. Uh, and, of course, this mass range is very exciting because it's accessible to LHC and, and possibly also other experiments. But there's another reason for being uh, interested in WIMPs, which is that they're present in, in many extensions of the standard model. And I would particularly emphasize uh, that they appear naturally in attempts to understand the strength of the weak interactions, or if you prefer, uh, the mass of the Higgs boson, the problem of naturalness and the hierarchy that Jean mentioned briefly at the end of his talk. So the, the, there's various examples of such theories, uh, extra dimensions. Well, they could contain a WIMP candidate if they have a particular type of uh, discrete symmetry. Uh, but as I said, I'm going to focus on, on supersymmetry, uh, which remains my long and, for the moment, lost love. So uh, you know, I, I'm often asked, you know, what physics do I expect or hope to see beyond the standard model? And uh, I always write supersymmetry in the largest font that will fit on the slide. And, of course, then people say, well, you know, aren't you discouraged that supersymmetry has not appeared at the LHC? And I say, well, you no, know, disappointed maybe, but uh, not yet discouraged, perhaps even encouraged, because I would argue that round one of the LHC actually gave us three additional reasons uh, for loving supersymmetry. Uh, one is that it naturally stabilizes the electroweak vacuum, which, as you probably know, is an issue in the standard model. It made a successful prediction for the mass of the Higgs boson. It said it should weigh uh, less than about 130 GV in at least simple models. And it also predicted that the couplings should be similar to those in the standard model. So, as I said, new motivations for loving supersymmetry over and above all the ones that we had previously like uh, naturalness, uh, grand unification, uh, the role in string theory, uh, and, of course, dark matter. So, of course, this is the point where, I, in addition to my scientific arguments, I should disclose my personal bias, that uh, I have been uh, interested in and fascinated by working on supersymmetric uh, dark matter for, uh, for a long time. But more generally, how does one uh, set about looking for, for dark matter? So uh, this is a, a famous diagram, which uh, you've probably seen in 
very similar forms on, on many occasions. So we have a dark matter on the left, we have a standard model on the right, we have some sort of new physics which uh, connects the two together. And uh, the connection between dark matter and the standard model proceeds obviously in various different directions. It can proceed from left to right. Uh, for example, annihilation in the universe, uh, dark matter particles go through some new physics and produce standard model particles. And I already mentioned the fact that uh, Pierre was one of the pioneers in that, as we uh, heard yesterday. Uh, then, of course, there's um, production at the LHC. Uh, so uh, you collide uh, protons, and with a bit of luck, you might uh, produce pairs of weakly interacting massive particles. Alternatively, you can go in a cross-channel, and uh, you can uh, look for the, uh, directly for the scattering of dark matter particles on standard model particles. And, of course, you can also look for annihilation of dark matter particles today uh, in the cosmic rays. So many of these topics are going to be discussed in more detail in uh, subsequent talks uh, today. And of course, all of these topics are in some sense uh, the business uh, of APC and hence uh, part of uh, Pierre's vision. So let me start off uh, with uh, one that hasn't been so much emphasized so far, perhaps might not be talked about so much uh, in the rest of the day, and that is uh, searches for dark matter at the LHC. So uh, you're probably all familiar with uh, the classic LHC dark matter signature. You uh, bash two protons together, uh, and uh, you look at stuff coming out uh, transversely to the beam collision direction, and uh, you look for events where you have uh, stuff coming out on one side, but not on the other side. Uh, of course, there has to be something by momentum conservation, uh, but that something is invisible, uh, presumably some sort of weakly interacting massive particle, because it might be neutrinos, but with a bit of luck, it might be, uh, might be WIMPs. So that's the classic LHC dark matter signature. You look for missing transverse energy carried away by massive dark matter particles. However, as you well know, uh, nothing has shown up yet at the LHC. So no sign of supersymmetry, for that matter, no sign of anything else exotic. And uh, so uh, many of us who are uh, pursuing new physics at the LHC are wondering, well, should we continue to look in the same way that I described on the previous slide? Uh, maybe we should look in some sort of nooks and crannies of parameter space, or, or maybe we should look for novel signatures. So I don't have time to do justice to all those various different ways of looking for dark matter. What I would like to do is to discuss the prospects for looking for dark matter in the future based on what we currently have from the LHC. So I'm part of a group called Master Code that uh, tries to combine all the various different experimental constraints on extensions of the standard model, particularly supersymmetry. And uh, this table here uh, is a little bit reminiscent of some of Jean's uh, tables. So this summarizes the data that we input into, into our FITs. Actually, this is not all the data that we put into our FITs. This is only the, the new data which came in between the FITs that we did last year and the FITs that we did the previous year. Anyway, so we get uh, constraints on new physics from electroweak observables, from flavor observables, uh, from dark matter observables, so the overall density, uh, upper limits on the scattering rate, and of course we get a lot of constraints from those unsuccessful LHC searches. Now in all this uh, slide, there are two places where there's some discrepancy between the standard model and uh, what is uh, measured. So one is G minus two of the muon, which Jean has advertised, and that's something that could, I think, easily be explained by supersymmetry. Uh, and I'll return to that in a moment. And the other one which he advertised is those uh, B physics flavor anomalies. So those I also find very intriguing, but it's not so obvious to me how to explain them. I thought very much echo what Jean said about that. And, and certainly I don't know how to explain them within the sort of supersymmetric model that I'm going to be focusing on. Well, actually, supersymmetry is not a model. 
Supersymmetry is actually a framework. Uh, like quantum field theory is a framework. And you can write down many different quantum field theories. You can write down many different supersymmetric theories. You might say, well, okay, let me focus on the minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model. Uh, but even then, uh, there's a tremendous ambiguity in the way in which the model can appear. You might get uh, compressed spectra, you might find some sort of stealthy version of the theory, uh, you might have something which, you give you, uh, which looks natural from some point of view, you might have something which looks unnatural from some point of view. Remember that supersymmetry is a very nice principle, but when you actually ask yourself, what are the masses of the supersymmetric particles, we don't know, and there's many possible options. So uh, the way that I summarize that is by saying that there are no signposts in superspace. We have to basically explore all possible directions. So uh, one of the things that we've, we've been doing in the master code collaboration is to uh, look at uh, a phenomenological minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model, uh, which our primary could have over 100 parameters, but it's very difficult to make a systematic exploration of a theory with over 100 parameters. So we restrict ourselves to uh, a version uh, which just have as a 11 what we think are the most essential uh, and interesting uh, parameters. Uh, now, I'd emphasize that you know, one wants to explore the parameter space as well as possible, and there are various statistical techniques for that, which I'm not going to describe in any detail. But we actually do two different surveys of the parameter space, uh, one with and one without trying to incorporate a supersymmetric ex explanation of, of G minus two. And, and because of dark matter, uh, we do dedicated sampling in the regions where you get the right dark matter density. And I'll describe that in a little bit more detail in a moment. And, uh, and overall in our survey, we uh, generate something like uh, 2 billion supersymmetric uh, parameter sets. So I'm not going to go through the details of all that. Let me just show you uh, a few results of all this. So you can do a fit to all the available data. You can then look for the best fit point. And uh, this shows you the spectrum at the uh, best fit point in this uh, phenomenological MSSM, in a fit including G minus two. And the good news here is that actually there's a fair amount of supersymmetric particles that might be accessible to the LHC. So uh, if we're talking about the future, uh, you know, maybe you should be making a date to meet supersymmetry uh, in the coming years. Maybe not in run two of the LHC, maybe in run three of the LHC, but you shouldn't assume <coughs> that the LHC has shot its bolt as far as looking for supersymmetry is concerned. So that fit was including G minus two. You could also make a fit which uh, drops the G minus the supersymmetric explanation of G minus two, and that's what's done here. So that the spectrum looks significantly different. Uh, the decay modes are also significantly different. But again, you find uh, supersymmetric particles that could be accessible to the LHC. So uh, you guys who, and girls who are working on ATLAS continue looking for supersymmetry. Okay, but my job is to talk about dark matter. So uh, in this class of models that I'm talking about, uh, there is a very natural dark matter candidate. And in fact, in all the sampling that I described, uh, we impose the constraint that we get the right cold dark matter density. So then you can ask yourself, uh, okay, first question, how heavy is this dark matter particle? As I already said, there are very general reasons in WIMP theories to expect that the dark matter particle could weigh between 100 GV and 1 TV. And that's exactly what we find. So uh, here is uh, the result with G minus two, is it was out without G minus two. In this case, uh, the lightest supersymmetric particle, the dark matter candidate, uh, prefers to have a mass somewhere around 250 GV. And if you drop G minus two, then uh, the spectrum tends to drift up. And the lightest supersymmetric particle, the preferred mass, 
is about 1 TV. Okay, so what are the prospects for uh, discovering that dark matter particle? So let me start off uh, by focusing on direct dark matter detection. So uh, all of you are, I think, very familiar with the principle here. You uh, go uh, deep underground uh, to shield yourself from uh, cosmic radiation, and you look for uh, dark matter particles in the halo, striking some uh, nucleus in your detector, uh, depositing energy which you can detect in various different ways. So this is uh, by now a very famous survey of uh, the status and prospects for such searches, uh, prepared for the uh, Snowmass uh, meeting in uh, 2013 with a minor update. So uh, here what you see is uh, these solid lines represent uh, experiments whose results have been published at that time. Uh, the dashed curves represent prospects in uh, future, uh, at that time, future experiments. Notice this uh, yellow shaded region and the uh, orange dashed line here down the bottom. Uh, so this is where you hit uh, an almost irreducible background coming from uh, astrophysical neutrinos. So these tend to come from cosmic rays, these come from the sun. And uh, you see that uh, the dark matter search naturally separates into two regions, uh, depending on the, whether the WIMP weighs above about 10 GV or whether it weighs less. So the sort of dark matter count that I've been talking about uh, is on the right-hand side of this plot. And uh, indeed, this uh, tasteful pink region here is uh, an artist's impression from 2013 of the uh, range of parameter space that uh, supersymmetric models are likely to finish up in. So uh, masses, as I already said, between about 100 and 1,000 GV, and cross-sections which might well be within reach of the next generation of experiments, but you'll notice they could also be below this neutrino floor, in which case the prospects for uh, direct dark matter detection would obviously be much more difficult. So, so that was from a, a sort of generic survey done in uh, 2013. Uh, here I just show you some uh, results from uh, our analysis in the uh, phenomenological MSSM models that I discussed previously. And uh, so you see the same sort of plot as you saw before with this uh, neutrino floor down here and uh, various uh, experiments, uh, these sensitivity curves along here. Uh, so since 2013, a number of new experiments have uh, produced results. Uh, so far, no success. Uh, but one experiment uh, we know is about to announce a new result, xenon one ton. And uh, we're all on tenterhooks to see uh, what they produce because they should have a significant improvement on uh, the previous experimental results. So uh, the uh, left plot here, again, is with G minus 2. The right plot, oops, is without G minus 2. So you might be worrying, wondering about all these uh, gaudy colors here. So we heard yesterday about Pierre's pioneering work on co-annihilation, where the relic density of the dark matter particle is fixed by annihilating with some other heavier supersymmetric particle. And in this sort of phenomenological model that I'm studying, there's many different options for what that next to lightest supersymmetric particle might be. And that's what's illustrated by these various different colors. So these colors represent regions where one of those mechanisms uh, comes into play. The... Uh, the green stars here, these are the best fit points, uh, which are, uh, as always in this sort of prediction, comfortably beyond the current experimental reach, but hopefully within the future experimental reach. Now, always dangle a carrot in front of your experimental colleagues. But, as you can see, uh, the cross-section could be too small to be observed. Okay, so that's direct dark matter scattering search. How about uh, indirect searches for dark matter? 
So uh, there's been a lot of interest in looking for the products of annihilations of dark matter particles in the galactic halo. So two of these dark matter particles flying around in the halo, they meet each other, they have a one-night stand somewhere out there, and that produces some sort of stable particle that you can detect in the cosmic rays. Uh, for example, antiprotons. So this is actually one of the first ideas that was proposed to look for uh, dark matter. And uh, here are uh, data from the uh, AMS-02 collaboration, not the latest data, but I think that they make the point quite well. Uh, so these colored bands here uh, represent uh, best effort calculations of the background coming from production of secondary antiprotons by primary matter cosmic rays, which are subject to various different uncertainties, cross-section, propagation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is actually taken from a, a paper by uh, Pierre Salati et al. He's hidden among the et al's down there. And, well, if you look at this, uh, it, it looks like those cosmic ray calculations are compatible with what is seen. Some people argue that uh, maybe there might be you know, some sort of excess over here, but I think that's probably a premature conclusion. Okay, so with antiprotons, how about uh, positrons? So uh, these are the, the latest data from uh, AMS-02 on uh, the production of uh, cosmic ray positrons uh, from uh, an AMS meeting that they held uh, a few weeks ago. So uh, here you see uh, the positron fraction, fraction of electron plus positron, uh, which you see goes up and then it comes down again. And some people have argued, well, maybe that could be characteristic of annihilations of some dark matter particles into, into positrons. It seems very difficult to my mind to make such a scenario work. And, uh, well, this is taken from a, another uh, paper by Al et Pierre Salati et al. And uh, so this is their effort to fit not the latest AMS-02 data, but somewhat earlier AMS-02 data. And, uh, well, you can more or less do it you know, with a bit of luck. Uh, obviously, they would have to adjust parameters if they want to uh, fit th the last couple of points there. But if you want to do this, the problem is that you need an absolutely enormous dark matter annihilation cross-section. So uh, this is uh, the chi-squared uh, as a function of the uh, dark matter particle mass. Uh, these different colored bands <coughs> correspond to uh, different cosmic ray models. Mm -hmm. They've taken those uncertainties into account. Uh, so the best fit point here requires an annihilation cross-section for these dark matter particles, which is 272 times larger than what you would need uh, in that sort of freeze-out calculation, which I mentioned earlier on, and which you saw featured yesterday uh, in the talk about Pierre's work. You need an absolutely enormous cross-section. And, and if those guys annihilated at such an enhanced rate in the early universe, then there just wouldn't be any dark matter particles. The density would be suppressed by a corresponding factor. Moreover, there are upper limits on the dark matter annihilation rate coming from other experiments, uh, in particular from the CMB. So uh, this band here represents the, uh, the range uh, that you would require uh, in a simple annihilation model. Uh, and uh, these are the upper limits coming from uh, the CMB. And uh, you know, to increase this by two and a half orders of magnitude looks like it's going to be very difficult. So, so, so what do we say about those uh, positrons? Could they have some sort of astrophysical source? And uh, there's been a lot of uh, toing and froing discussing whether those positrons could come from pulsars. And uh, I'm not going to go through the, uh, the details of that. Uh, this is a plot from uh, a paper by uh, Stefano Profumo et al., where they actually get quite a good bit to the AMS-02 data with... Uh, pulsar sources 
then the posit they produce positrons, those positrons diffuse out, and if you have a plausible model for the way in which those positrons diffuse out, uh, you can fit the data. Okay, so just in the last uh, few minutes, I'd like to talk about something completely different, completely crazy, forget about WIMPs, forget about supersymmetry, forget everything that I said in the previous 24 minutes. We've heard a lot about gravitational waves, we've heard about neutron star mergers. Is it possible that you could look for evidence of dark matter in neutron star mergers? So I'm not going to discuss the merger itself, I'm going to discuss what happens after the merger. So uh, here you've got a, a couple of uh, neutron stars. Uh, when they merge, they form a sort of disk, they go around each other, and they gradually uh, merge. And uh, this is taken from a, a paper by uh, Takami et al. So neutron stars call neutron star cores orbit and oscillate <coughs> gradually and then eventually uh, they uh, ring down. So during that ring down process, you could in principle see gravitational waves, which would have a characteristic uh, set of frequencies uh, depending on the dynamics of those uh, neutron cores. And uh, this is taken from uh, the paper by Takami et al. Other people do similar calculations. So you get uh, features in the uh, frequency spectrum of the gravitational waves, uh, which are sensitive to the dynamics of the neutron stars. So what Takami and collaborators also did was they uh, made a very simple toy mechanical model of this process, which basically uh, treats those neutron, merging neutron stars like a couple of... Uh, bowling balls, which are attached by some sort of spring, which is then rotating, uh, oscillating, and dissipating. And uh, I won't go through the details of this. It's actually a very simple toy mechanical model, but it reproduces incredibly well uh, the detailed simulations of uh, the neutron star merger and subsequent dynamics. So you're supposed to compare the uh, pictures in the top and bottom of this and you're supposed to say, ah, yes, those look quite similar. So the dynamics of this neutron star merger may not be so complicated. So, so what we did was we said, well, okay, supposing that those neutron stars also contained blobs of dark matter. So then you would actually get two pairs of oscillating cores because the dynamics of the neutron stars would be different from the dynamics of the uh, dark matter cores. So you set up a simple uh, oscillatory model. You check that you reproduce the results of Takami et al. when there is no dark matter. Uh, and then you put in some dark matter and see what you get. And typically, what you get is an additional peak in this uh, frequency spectrum here. So uh, the dark matter peak sitting in the middle there, uh, it weakens over a period of a few milliseconds. Uh, actually, if you've got different dark matter cores in the two different neutron stars, you could actually get two peaks. So um, this is admittedly a pretty crazy idea, but I think you know, it's something that you know, should be looked at when you're looking at the mergers of neutron stars. Uh, there could be something more complicated than the standard ring down picture. And I'm not going to discuss it in detail, but we have some uh, models of dark matter uh, particles that could actually give you significant fractions of dark matter in those neutron star cores, which I'm not going to discuss. So these, if there is this dark matter present inside neutron stars, then it could also have effects on the neutron star masses and radii. It could affect also the maximum possible mass of the neutron star. Uh, it would affect the tidal deformability, and as you know, uh, the first LIGO-Virgo data on the first neutron star merge already been used to give constraints on the tidal deformability. Uh, and so that's then been used to constrain neutron star equations of state. But we would say, you know, if those neutron stars contain some significant admixture of dark matter, then that constraint on the equation of state should be revised. 
Okay, that brings me to the end of what I wanted to say. Supersymmetry is still alive. There's many variants. In fact, I would say that the situation overall has not changed very much since LHC 1.1. Of course, there's all sorts of other WIMP scenarios which I didn't have time to discuss. I discussed the prospects for finding supersymmetry in other WIMPs at the LHC in indirect dark matter scattering. I think those prospects are better than indirect searches, for example, using the positron flux or the antiproton flux. That said, of course, it's, the time is ripe for looking at uh, crazy ideas. Uh, so uh, here is something which summarizes the situation with WIMPs, uh, not dead yet. Uh, on the other hand, whether they're actually the candidate that will be elected, uh, I don't know. So at the beginning of my talk, I promised to sort of uh, bookend uh, my uh, knowledge of uh, or my meetings with Pierre. So I thought I'd start with uh, the last time I met Pierre. This is when uh, Mary Kay came to CERN in 2016 for a memorial meeting for uh, Bruno Zamino. And uh, there is uh, Pierre looking uh, almost as youthful as uh, on my opening slide. Uh, I promised Jean that I would show the other photograph that I have, which is the one in which Jean is prominent. I, I'm sure that Pierre would not be mine being put into the back place. So that was my last meeting with Pierre. Uh, and I want to come back to what was perhaps my first meeting with Pierre. And I don't go back as far as some of you. I went back to uh, 1978, and uh, here is a, another theory division institution, the theory division picnic, and uh, here is Pierre you know, observing uh, what is going on. You can have fun rec recognizing some of the other people uh, there. Well, that picture you've already seen, but I'd like to show you this second picture that I have. And uh, this is Pierre making his play. Uh, and what I see there is somebody who is very focused, He's got an objective. He's heading towards that objective. On the previous slide, you saw that people had all sorts of different ideas about what to do. But Pierre had a very clear idea. Thank you. <laughs>